I think Spinoza has some interesting things to say about that. And I, I, I wonder whether you agree, and I wonder whether you think now is the time to bring out the Spinoza, or whether we should keep him in the, in the box. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's good. So uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled. But, um, you know, so Raj and I knew uh, each other for a half hour before this event. And so uh, yeah, when he, when he suggested that we talk about Spinoza, I was um, yeah, I'm, I'm pleased and a little, I'm, I'm often hesitant in such contexts to bring up Spinoza because he's uh, the philosopher I find most difficult and it's difficult and so it's often, I don't even want to recommend that people read Spinoza because it's, <laughs> it's a lot of time, it makes it, it's a lot of work. Okay, but here's here's where I think, I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this and here's two ways I think of, of attacking it that might be useful. <laughs> Yeah, so one is, what, what Raj is already suggesting is, is a certain notion of a, you know, we, we often think, of, when we're thinking about ecological problems and problems both of capitalism and industry, two is about the, that what has wrought the damage is really the enlightenment. You know, both in its, in its Eurocentric form, you know, the, the enlightenment that somehow it, it is directly in line with conquest and, and colonization and colonial reason. And that conquest uh, is also, in, I mean, that uh, enlightenment is in, in line with um, environmental destruction, the, the human superiority over nature, use of nature, etc. And so, what, 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 in a way, Raj is suggesting is, well, let's actually look at enlightenment not as one thing, but in enlightenment and even reason as something that within it, even in its European forms, has alternatives present. And so, we might look at Spinoza as a kind of alter enlightenment. You know, uh, that, 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 that suggests alternatives to the, uh, the dominant form of enlightenment that we've, been, that we've inherited. Okay, and so what would that mean? One, I have two strategies for this, and I think I'll say them <coughs> brief and see if they make, if either makes sense to worth continuing. One is, and it's sort of picking up with what Raj suggested about reason. I would, my focus would be um, on the continuity in Spinoza, or the, the, the building in Spinoza between reason and love. Um, love is really the ultimate arrival point for reason uh, in Spinoza. And so, what does love mean for Spinoza? Love is the love is joy, the increase of my power to think and act, and the recognition of an external cause. So, my love for you is really that I recognize that you are the cause of my increased power to think and act. I mean, like, even the simple sense, I mean, it makes sense of love to me, like, aren't there certain people that with them you actually do think more get better? Like, there, and there are also, unfortunately, some people with whom you think more poorly. But, um, but, this, but this thinking about, uh, way of thinking, you know, thinking together as, as, as being an increase of our power, and then acting together as an increase of our power, which is joy. And so that, if reason, if reasons, uh, if reason's final vocation is love, and love is, is thought of this way, it does give uh, a notion of, I mean, I think I would, I would be intrigued by, or I would, I would it seems to me quite a, uh, an inviting thing to think about what a management of the common would be through such a notion of reason and love, or reason and continuity of love. Okay, that's one direction to go. Another one, which is um, maybe more challenging is, is Spinoza's understanding of nature and humans' relationship to nature. So, uh, you know, he says at the, in the, in the um, introduction to book three of the ethics that humans are not a realm within a realm. They're, they're, we're not an empire within an empire. It's not that there's human nature and then there's nature as such as if they're different. In fact, and then he goes into geometrical things. You know, like we obey the same laws as nature. And so he's doing two things there, which I think are both super challenging. The first one is against a certain notion of the destructive enlightenment, which is humans are superior to nature and therefore have the right to use nature as they see fit. You know, and so the human superiority might be thought in any number of ways, reason, language, but there are a number of, we have a lot of candidates for why humans are superior to the rest of nature, to animals and to the rest of nature in the history of European philosophy. But he's saying, no, in fact, humans are not superior. They are, in fact, they operate by the same laws. They're identical. So on the one hand, they're not superior. 
maybe more interesting for this discussion is really the opposite thing that he's also saying here, which is that humans are not inferior to nature either. I think a lot of ecological perspectives construct nature as the ultimate point to which humans are lacking. You know what I mean? Like that, and, and, uh, and so in that sense, the problem is not, and, and, yeah, right. and so, um, how should I, I, I don't know. Well, I don't have to say that better. Maybe that one that one's already makes sense. Instead, what I what he's what he's challenging us to understand, and I think on, on the surface it could seem completely false, but you've got to go with Spinoza sometimes, and then it maybe it works out. But the humans are really absolutely part of nature. I think that has really you know important consequences. Like, why is human part of nature? Like, you might say, well, no, like uh, humans think. And Moses says, no, no, rocks think. They just think more slowly than you <laughs> Which, I mean, he's, you've got to say that, though, because they have their two attributes. I mean, they obviously have extension. They have bodies, you know, but they also have thought. And so and that's what part of the way. So you'd say, OK, he's crazy. But that's the kind of thing you have to work through to, um, yeah, to accept it. Any, in any case, it, I think it does pose an intriguing and potentially useful notion of the common in an alternative to the forms of thinking about it that we're used to. Like maybe that's, at the very least, even if you're going to say, it turns out, whatever, he's a crazy idiot, at least it denaturalizes the way, you know, our, and it shows, you know, it, it shows the, in a way, the strangeness of our current assumptions about it, either as human superior to nature or human superior. Or, on the other hand, I think that first one too, that, 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 that uh, the assumption that reason is not only detached from, but, but even um, antagonistic to love. I'm trying to think, think reason as, the, as one of the most sure paths to love, that would be the case, is also a, um, uh, yeah, an alternative notion that might get somewhere. That was my attempt at this. I think that, that that would be an amazing way of thinking. Uh, I think that's a fantastic way of thinking about how we how how the commons challenges uh, the idea of the commons uh, challenges us to be different. And, and I mean, not, not just to, to engage in different politics, but actually be different. Um, and I guess on that note. I spent with a group of Dalit women in, um, outside of Hyderabad in rural India and because I was interested in how they were managing their finances and their own resources and they, they've got a different system to the one that Muhammad Yunus has come up with, Grameen Bank, which are very critical. And uh, what struck me was that together they have all these little groups of women that come together, about 10 in each group through this village and they can't be related to one another. And they, they decide to collectively pull their, their, their resources so that you know, if someone in the group wants an ox or something, they can go to the bank and get a loan, and then the government will subsidize the interest for them so they don't pay any more than 2%. Right? But as they come up with these groups, they decide collectively what their rules will be. And they took me to the, the, the shelter where they would often meet um, to discuss you know, what their next project together would be. And what struck me, you know, sort of talking about love, and, and then it got me thinking about the limits and the distance, yeah? Because they devised their own rules. And together, as a group, they painted the walls with all the rules and decorated the rules inside this shelter. Right? It was just magnificent. It was so beautiful. And it was such an expression of love. But the rules were there to sort of provide a limit, but they were rules that they they collectively decided and talked about, you know? So in a sense, that sort of reasoning was an expression of love or an effect of love too, you know? And it was one that they recognised that was enabling them as a group to float. And they were the most welcoming people. 